Our resident science guru, Dr Carl, explains the perils of leaving Earth. There was an astronaut, Richard Heed, who flew into orbit at just under the official height maximum for going into space. He was six foot three. I'm going to use American notation. You know, cubic furlongs for square metres. So what, six foot four was the, the cutoff? The cutoff. Right. And after six days in space... He had lengthened to be Ill, unable to travel in space under NASA conditions. So he'd grind more grind. than an inch. Yeah, because you've got these vertebrae in your spine stacked on top of each other and you've got the little discs in between and they'd swollen out. And the trouble is that as they swell, your nerve, the sciatic nerve, is still the same length. It runs from the bottom of your spine over the buttocks and all the way down to your big toe. And about one third of astronauts come back from space with lower back pain. And the other problem they have with the bones, besides just lengthening, is osteoporosis. A postmenopausal woman can lose one and a half percent of bone mass in a year. Astronauts, more than that, in a month. And do they ever recover that when they get back to Earth? They recover, they go through a very rigorous training and they recover most of the mass, but it's not laid down as efficiently and beautifully so as poorly a, structured a bone. poorly structured bone. It's not as good. And they know that they're at a higher risk of bone fracture now and for the rest of their lives and especially in later life but hey they, they, they take risks and well it's know. a risk you take i guess if you choose to go into space uh, but there are other long-term detrimental effects cardiovascular too. so your heart so you, you get this blood pooling in your head it's not pulled down by gravity so you sort of got this sort of headachey thing there's blood coagulating in your nose so your nose feels like a block like you're hanging upside down and food doesn't taste as good because it interferes with your sense of smell and your heart gets rounder and loses something like 25% of its strength after a couple of weeks and on your way down and just on earth afterwards you might just sort of faint just like that you're walking along and just suddenly you faint and then gradually you come back to normal. Now this all comes obviously down to a lack of gravity we won't even get to the radiation aspect we'll, yeah. we'll come to that in a moment but there's clearly the, the less gravity you have the less resistance there is and therefore your, your body suffers as a result. What, what I was surprised was that people floating around in orbit, uh, for instance in the International Space Station, it's not zero gravity at all, is it? No, it's 90% of the gravity. So imagine that you build a, a long skinny pin and it's 300 kilometres above the Earth. Well, the Earth is this big and they're just that little much above the surface, so they're experiencing 90% of the gravity that we experience here. But well, it's the fact that they're free-falling, essentially. They're free-falling. So they're travelling at 7 kilometres a second, so in one second they go forward 7 kilometres, and in one second they fall 4.5 metres, and the space station falls 4.5 metres, but in one second, in 7 kilometres, the Earth curves by four and a half metres. So, so they're falling around the Earth. They're fall so it's like um, Douglas Adams said, the way to levitate is to f uh, f throw yourself at the ground and miss it. <laughs> and so they're, they're always falling and they're always missing the ground because of their horizontal velocity. All right, how can astronauts overcome that issue of, of weightlessness then in, in, in terms of keeping their body in, in peak physical condition, if they can at all? Can't do much about the heart. They can do muscle strength and they can do, they can do impacts on the bone. But for, for example, with their muscles, they would lose 20 or 30% of their strength. And even though they do massive, massive exercises, an hour, an hour and a half every day, they'll still, still come back to Earth having lost 30% of their strength. And if they're up there for, say, six months at a time, you'll see them being carried out. And they basically have the structural strength of well-boiled spaghetti. They just, <laughs> they just sort of plug them into a banana chair. You stay there. They can't even stand up by themselves. All right, that's just one aspect of space travel. The other, of course, is the exposure to the elements there, radiation being the biggest killer, a oh, yeah. potential killer. What, yeah. what are the effects there? Well, there was a guy called Sergei Avdeyev who has spent a total of two years in space in various lumps. And in one, one occasion he was up there and the, so, the sun had a hissy fit and started exploding stuff. So we went to the centre of the spacecraft where there was a maximum shielding. So there were walls, but they also had their supplies and the food and the water. And so he put himself right in the middle of everything. There was as much mass what, around him. Cowering behind the baked ca beans. Behind the baked beans. Yeah. And then he, he was there in the dark and the radiation coming through from the sun was so high that firstly, in the dark, with his eyes shut, there were flashes of light everywhere. The radiation was landing on his retina and making it fire off. And secondly, his skin felt like it was crawling with spiders and stuff walking all over it because the radiation was hitting the touch sensors in his skin 
and triggering it. So he's just sitting there and he's, he's seeing flashes of light and his skin's crawling and he's just knowing he's getting a massive radiation. So dose. just put this in context, for the average human being on the planet, we receive what the equivalent of about six, eight X-rays a year yeah, in, in radiation, a, a background radiation yeah, and so on. Yeah. How many would he have received? Five uh, an hour, 10, 15, 20. But these guys, they undertake risks that you and I don't. I mean, imagine the space shuttle. Would you fly, would you, would you catch a bus if you knew that every 70th time every, you and everybody else on the bus would die? No. So these guys are different. They're prepared to take those risks. But in general, you don't have big storms like that all the time. And as you say, humans will inevitably become a space-going race. We will become a space-going race. And at some stage, half the humans that exist will be off the planet. And according to Freeman Dyson, we will evolve ourselves because we can do genetic engineering. And the proper shape for a human being is, wait for it, a cloud of iron vapour weighing 50 kilograms, the diameter of a planet, floating in space through magnetic fields, and yes, you can still have sex because sex happens in your brain, according to Frank Zappa. <laughs> Dr. Cal, thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Andrew.